All right, Hubs, let's do it, mate. So I want to kind of start from the start and talk about your journey all the way through. So tell us a little bit about why you first got into boxing. Yeah, okay. Well, I used to play a lot of footy when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And then my old man was a uh, boxer back in his day, um, trained through your old man. And then, um, yeah, I was going through a bit of a rough patch, I suppose, you know, from school point of view and from also just on the footy field and stuff like that. I was always a smaller kid. Um, lacked a little bit of confidence as well when I was a bit younger, just in terms of my build and my frame. And I didn't ever want to get, um, you know, if someone said something to me or someone, you know, if some altercation happened, I didn't want to be able to, you know, feel like I had to cower away from it or anything like that. So my dad always kind of wanted me to get into boxing and he kind of always never forced me to do it, but definitely nurtured me that way because it was something that he did when he was younger and he loved doing. So took me down to your old man's house um, and started training with your old man from when I was about 13, 14. I was pretty young. Um, did a good probably year of training just alongside my footy, um, just to sort of keep fit in the off season. And you know, my old man was oh, we'll toughening up a bit, you know? <laughs> so got me into a bit of boxing um, with Senior and he was hard work. I did a few uh, sessions with your, um, with Neil as well. They were very hard, <laughs> they were very hard. Um, but yeah, then eventually went on to have my first fight um, through the boys in Kilo and Team Alice Show, which was great for my first one. Um, luckily won my first fight as well, which was another enjoyable experience, but something that me and my dad did alongside one another, because again, I was very scared to do it and something that was very much kind of out of my comfort zone from what I would normally do, I suppose. I was used to playing footy with all my friends and you know, I was at school with my friends and everything I did with, with my mates. And then when I kind of went off on my own to you know, start a bit of boxing and do something that was, you know, strictly for myself, you know, naturally all my mates were kind of like, oh, what are you doing that for? You know what I mean? Like, oh, just come play footy. And I was like, nah, I kind of want to just do this. And it was very much against the grain of kind of what I would normally sort of do. And then, yeah, had a, uh, did my training camp alongside my dad, which was awesome to sort of help me, you know, I suppose mentally throughout the journey. And then, yeah, luckily won my first fight. And yeah, that was kind of my pathway, I suppose, of getting into it. And then and originally I was kind of just going to have a few fights just to, in the off season for footy. And then once I had my first fight, I was kind of like, wow, this is, you know, this is heaps better than <laughs> you know anything that I've ever done, any kind of feelings and emotions. And it was just such a, a, a whole kind of physical, mental and, and sort of spiritual journey that was just so different from what I was kind of used to and really just put myself in such a different environment where I just got a whole, like learnt a whole different side of myself as well, you know? So once I kind of had that first kind of experience, um, to be honest with you, I just never really looked back to go back to footy, to be honest. And I was like, you know what, this is just what I'm going to do. I love this. And there was just nothing else like it, to be honest. So just stuck with it from then. Absolutely, mate. Now that's incredible. And as you mentioned, your dad knew my dad, Lester Ellis. Can you share a bit about that connection? And I guess having your dad as a role model and how that influenced you to take up something like boxing? Yeah, dad's always kind of been like, I suppose, like a superhero for me, I guess. I think a lot of people look at their their fathers like that, where they kind of look at them like like God, you know what I mean? Almost in a way when they're, when they're young and when they're growing up and even to this day, you know, and I'm sure you kind of feel the same with your dad. You always make reference back to him and, you know, his kind of achievements and stuff like that. But my father, yeah, he started, he started fighting when he was probably around my age as well. He, he'd done it ever since he was young. Um, and he had a good handful of fights through senior and stuff like that as well. And something that he was kind of always interested in. And then when he got to about, I think he had me when he was about 22 or 23 years old. Um, and naturally, you know, I suppose life kind of got in the way for him. He was kind of just doing amateur boxing. He was a good boxer and he did want to take it further, but you know, I came along and then he had to look at getting a house and paying bills and, you know, naturally it kind of went on the back burner for him because he had other responsibilities that were more important than his own, fighting career or his own kind of fighting dreams and stuff like that. So I think naturally when I started getting to the age of, you know, kind of similar to him when I was a young teenager, it was something that he kind of by curious, uh, what's the word, by curiously kind of wanted to live through me, I guess, and, and get me involved in it just because he knew how much it was good for him and how much he loved it. Um, but yeah, naturally dad and my dad and your dad always kind of knew each other. Um, there was a period of time where they weren't as close as they once were, but once dad kind of got me back into it, um, that kind of whole connection, I suppose, kind of rekindled again. And then that's kind of when I met you and then kind of one thing led to another, I guess. For sure. And I remember the moment vividly. So we went to a restaurant 
for your dad's 40th yes. birthday. Yes. Um, and then obviously, yeah, we shared the news that we're opening up in Melton, which is obviously, you know, your, yourself and your family's hometown. The hometown. Yeah, and I remember <laughs> we were talking about it and then I remember you said, almost word for word, and I might be paraphrasing here, <laughs> like, oh, mate, you know, if you, need, if you need a hand with the kids' classes, you know, come on down. And I think, yeah, you're 17 at that stage, 16 yeah. or 17. I don't think you had your licence yet. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, once we did open up, I took you up on that offer, and you're coming down and you're helping out with the kids. <clears throat> now, just before that moment, though, you did have, you were working at your first job at Ollie's <laughs> Chicken on, <laughs> on High Street. Ollie's Chicken. So um, talk to us about, I guess, your lengthy experience in the workforce <laughs> <laughs> prior to working at HitFit and then in the, and talk a little bit about the initial stages of that transition. Yes. So I had a couple, I had a couple of small jobs, I suppose, when I was starting. My, first, my very first one was Best and Less. Oh, I was not a fan of that. Retail, I swear, I've got, because I've just, I've for sure I've got undiagnosed ADHD so standing in a retail shop just on my own doing nothing for eight hours that was a drainer I just had too much energy I had to do something you know so then naturally I kind of turned to to fast food being a young kid I was like sweet went into Ollie's um, and one of my friends did it alongside with me as well Riley me and him were both working there and it was a um very different kind of experience, that's for sure. But I was there for maybe like eight or nine months. And then I was kind of in this transitional period when you guys were opening up in Melton. And I naturally, cause I just loved boxing and you know, I loved all you boys and I kind of just wanted to be around it a lot more often than, than not. And obviously Ollie's Trolleys was not gonna be my, <laughs> my career choice, that's for sure. But I was hitting this we very weird stage, I suppose, in my life. I suppose every kind of person goes through it where they're kind of going through year 11, going through year 12 and in school, it felt very much so it was like, my teachers were kind of, you know, you're either going to uni or you're being a tradie, what's it kind of gonna be? And I was kind of like, well, I don't really wanna do either of those things. And, you know, I kind of didn't really know what I wanted to do and everyone was really putting that pressure on me like, oh, what do you wanna do with your life? What are you gonna be doing? You know, what's your plans, this, that? And I was 16, 17, I was like, I don't know, man. I don't even know, <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to make a buy at the moment. So I was just, you know, I'll just get a job, make a few bucks on the side so that I've got some money coming in. And then um, once you boys were opening up in, in Melton, um, I remember dad was naturally kind of like, oh, if you boys need any help, this, that. And I was like, oh yeah. And I kind of just went off the back of dad, like, oh yeah, if you boys need any help, I'm happy to come down and, and do whatever. Um, and then, yeah, whether it was setting up or whether it's the kids' classes, I pretty much, yeah, was happy to do whatever. I was like, mate, anything you need me to do, I'm happy to do it, you know, whatever it is. Even if you need me come in and paint the walls or clean the toilets, whatever, I'm happy to do it. Just because I wanted to find something that I could do that was, you know, had a little bit more long-term vision as well. And naturally boxing was just like, I was paying to do it and I'd love to do it just as a hobby. So I was like, sweet, of course, I'd love to do that eventually as a job. Um, and then yeah, started just helping out with the kids' classes and then went from there. Absolutely, and what was that experience like helping out initially? So obviously, you know, I guess the role of an assistant coach is to go around, make sure everyone's <coughs> doing their thing, you know, like say some words of encouragement. Yep. I remember initially you weren't as loud in the sessions then as you are now. <laughs> 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 so what, talk to me about a bit how like, you know, that transition happened and what you learned in them, you know, early first couple of weeks. Yeah, definitely. I think it was, it was because again, it was something that I was never, I suppose at that point in my life, I wasn't a super, super shy kid. I was normally relatively social with people, but I was still just a kid, you know, and I was still just kind of learning, you know, social cues and, you know, emotional intelligence and this and that. And I didn't really know what I was doing when I was getting involved in it. Um, and then from having my first fight, that was such a different experience, you know, from anything I'd ever done before sports wise. And then when I kind of went into the working environment, obviously, you know, working at retail or working at fast food, it's very much like just get the job done. Whereas when I started to work for, you know, a gym and with people and things like that, it was just the, the skills required were just so much different, um, which naturally I didn't have at the start, you know, as you know, no one does when they first start any kind of role or any kind of job. Um, but yeah, it was definitely very, very different for me to start with because naturally I wasn't a very loud, kind of outgoing, you know, charismatic or witty kind of a, you know, kid when I first started. Um, and for me, when I was coaching and helping these kids, I was like, wow, some of these kids are, are my age, you know? <laughs> so it felt, it always felt a bit funny, um, you know, telling them what to do or, or them looking up at me. And I kind of didn't really understand it from that point of view. Or like these kids are looking up to me to, 
you know, give them advice and give them help where I was kind of like, oh, this kid's in my same year level, <laughs> you know? And it kind of felt a bit funny at that stage when I was first initially starting. And then funny story as well, I remember the first day that you called me up to do my first adults class, which that was horrifying, that was so scary. I remember Das called me, he, he called me about eight o'clock the night before, it was a Friday night and someone called in sick on the Saturday and Das had something come up, he couldn't do it for whatever reason. And he called me, he said, Harbs, um, are you available to do the 9 a.m. session tomorrow? I need you to do it because I've got no one else and I physically can't do it, I need you to do it, can you do it? And I went, yes, sir. And I remember I stayed up all night, I got like an hour of sleep probably, and I stayed up all night planning out this session, not that's dodgy, scrapped it, threw it out, read out the next one and planned out this whole thing. And I remember I got there and I was still only 17 and I had a group of 20, 25, you know, fully grown adults in front of me and I was still un not even an adult myself yet. And I remember I got on the mic and I stood in front of everyone. I was like, guys, this is my first ever class. This is my first ever session. So if I'm terrible at this, you know, give me a bit of slack. Uh, but everybody was awesome for the first one. It ended up being not as bad as I first thought. Um, and then, yeah, but that was still a very strong core memory for me. I was very scared on that first day, that's for sure. It's funny, you and then you touched on it then as well. So how has your role evolved over the years and what's kind of kept you motivated to take on additional responsibilities throughout that time? Yeah, so my, I suppose my positions kind of started from helping out with the kids' classes, just being a second, to then running the kids' classes, to then helping out with the adults, then running the adults, um, and then running the fighters, and then working in the sales and a little bit of management. And, you know, naturally kind of just was, you know, taking one step uh, above the next each, each, each and every time. It was a long process between each steps, that's for sure. Um, but it was something that I kind of always expressed interest in from seeing when Das was, you know, back at Keylor to then starting up your own place in Melton. And I remember when we were in the consult room initially, still early days, I was probably only three to six months in, and I said, yeah, you know, I'd love to have, you know, my own gym one day, that'd be awesome. And especially at that point, I was really into my fitness and I was really into my boxing. And I thought having my own boxing gym one day would be, you know, what a dream that would be, you know? So I remember saying that to you probably three to six months in. Now you were probably a bit more like, mate, you know, you're just helping out with the kids' classes, relax. <laughs> but Das definitely, you know, he, he painted that pathway for me and you definitely painted that pathway for me to say, you know, it's definitely possible. It's not gonna come easy. It's gonna take a lot of work for sure. But you know, mate, if this is something that you wanted to do, well, let's start here. And then once you get good at this, let's look and do in the next step. And I just pretty much took that for gospel and just went, you know what? I'm helping out with the kids' classes. How can I get as good as possible with the kids' classes? And then what's next? Okay, it's this. Let's get as good as possible with that. What's next? And naturally just kind of went to next step. And I just kind of wanted to be an expert in kind of every kind of field that I went in um, and just try my best to kind of go above and beyond in every single role that I had at the gym, I guess. Absolutely, man. And can you talk about any type of challenges that you faced along the way as you took on more roles and responsibilities, whether that be like in the gym professionally or also personally as well? Yeah, a couple of different things, I guess, because it was um, at that stage when I was, I was about a year into working at the gym, I guess, and well, not even really, maybe about eight months and we kind of hit COVID, um, which that was a pretty bad time period where I kind of just was getting into a groove of running the classes and stuff like that. And then obviously we shut doors and then we went inside and we were doing everything on Zoom. And that was again, a whole nother kind of skill set in itself from training people in person to now we're on Zoom and I have no equipment, no bags, nothing. We're kind of just having to make it up on the fly as we're going along. So that was another whole skill set in itself. And then that was a good year, two year period where we were in, you know, went back in the gym, went back out of the gym and we were always in this weird limbo phase. Then we we're doing some classes outside in the car park in the freezing cold. <laughs> that, was, that was another experience. Um, so yeah, we had a, we had a, COVID was probably the, the biggest thing for us as a business personally, for sure. Um, and something that affected me definitely a lot as well, even just mental health wise, when I was in COVID, it was like, I just turned 18. I was just a full grown adult now and I wasn't even allowed to leave my own four walls at home, which that was a really hard period for myself mentally for sure. Um, but I just thought to myself, you know what? It was probably a blessing in disguise almost in the end because I just had nothing else to do other than work. I was like, you know what? Well, 
I can't go out, I can't hang out with my mates, I can't go do this and this and that. Like I might as well just focus on my work because what else have I got to do? <laughs> you know? So I pretty much just went all in on my work from that stage, which was really good for me in the end actually, because it really kind of set into my work ethic and stuff like that moving forward even beyond COVID, because it was such a long period where I was just focused on work, where I come out of it and I was like, well, I'll just keep going with what I'm doing. Um, and then yeah, a couple of other personal issues along the way I went through a pretty rough breakup at one stage as well, which was never pleasant. I'm sure everyone's kind of been through their own kind of experiences with some heartbreak here or there. But yeah, I went through, again, kind of a, a rough period. I was with the girl for a long time and we did separate. And then another stage where I was kind of just left by myself. And I thought, you know what? I'll just make the best of a bad situation and just focus on work and just try to be as best as human as possible, focus on my work, got really back into my fighting again, won a good few fights on my way back in, um, which, was, which was awesome. And I find honestly for myself, the biggest challenges that I've had in my personal life and, and in business life, I guess as well, have been honestly my best periods of, of my life looking back on it actually, because that was when I could tr truly find out like who I was myself really, I guess, and kind of what I was made of and, you know, um, what I was capable of as well. For sure, and they say, mate, what's bad for the ego is good for the soul. It is. Um, so now 100%, and as you mentioned <clears throat> too, there's always gonna be trials and tribulations through any journey. One thing I'd like to focus on now, like what made you, I guess, keep belief in the hit fit vision? Like naturally in any relationship, whether it's a business relationship or personal relationship, at some point you're gonna be questioning, oh, like, you know, is this the place for me? Or this the relationship yeah. for me, et cetera. So what kind of, you know, helped you keep belief yeah what what just made you you know believe in the hit fit vision overall yeah i definitely had my times and i think everybody kind of does like you said where we had you know even myself and yourself we've had a few periods where we had a few hard awkward conversations which was you know natural at times and a few times i was sitting there going you know i suppose a little bit entitled going oh i should be getting this or i deserve that or whatever it might be um and I did have a few of those thoughts, you know, is this for me or, you know, what's the vision of this place? And I kind of was just, you know, speaking with you to see like, you know, what's your kind of goals? And I suppose at the stage, it was still very, very early days of even the gym, you know, let alone, you know, anything beyond the gym, you know, a second location or franchising or whatever it might be. Um, but I think as the gym grew and, you know, we started, you know, seeing some big growth and the team started getting better, and I was always talking with you about, you know, potentially opening up my own joint one day and how that would kind of look and how it would all kind of work. Once the gym sort of started to grow and we'd seen franchising and, and opening up multiple locations as a real possibility, that was when I kind of really, you know, and you obviously went a little bit more in depth with me about the possibilities. Obviously nothing was guaranteed, nothing was promised of course, but at least I knew that the chance was there and the opportunity was there and I went, you know what, with this business being at such a, an early stage, it was just such a good opportunity for me just to, to dive ahead first into it. And I just kind of, yeah, just was had conversations with you about the vision and it was in line with kind of where I wanted to go. You know, I wanted to have my own gym and, you know, I'd been working in the hit fit in Melton for, you know, at that point, three, four years, whatever it might've been. And, you know, it just made too much sense. And I thought, you know what, I'd love to be able to you know, get to a stage where I can have one one day. Um, and obviously you mentoring and guiding me, you know, of where you thought was gonna be best, um, you know, for me at that time um, and for the gym at the time as well was, um, was a big help for sure. So a lot of credit to yourself definitely to sort of, I suppose, break my beliefs because a lot of times I didn't really, I didn't know anything, you know what I mean? And you kind of did break a lot of my beliefs of what kind of was possible. Um, which was, yeah, probably the biggest thing for me, to be honest. No, fantastic, mate. We've certainly had a journey over the last few years, to say the least, like obviously starting out where a lot of yeah. the stuff I didn't know too, you know, like obviously everything was new and I didn't know what I was doing, especially in the early stages. Sometimes it still feels like <laughs> <laughs> that much shit going on, you yeah, know? Exactly. Um, but yeah, mate, you're a, a testament to what can happen when you can just head down, bum up, and if you can stay as neutral as possible and just get the job done at a certain point, even if you work through any kind of What's the word I'm looking for? Like uncertain thoughts or anything like that. At a yeah. certain point you get through, you look back and you'll be like, fuck, like 
thank God I done that. You know, yeah. it all makes sense like once you're looking back, but when you're in the thick of it at that time, it's a little bit hard, you know, you've got thoughts going around everywhere. I remember we had a comment, we've had lots of obviously conversations, you know, throughout the years, some where we're staying up to, you know, 10, 11, 12 yeah. p.m. at night at the gym, which obviously is the things people don't see. And at least for myself, like once we obviously started growing and I started becoming aware of like the numbers other gyms are doing, like, oh, how much members do they have? You know, like roughly how much, you know, revenue would a normal gym make? And yeah. then like, again, a point where I've just been so head down and bum up, I'm like, oh, we're probably like three times or four times bigger than this company, like per location. Yeah. And they're like massive, like they're yeah. huge. And then even for myself, that obviously gave me, you know, more belief. and. I was thinking about the model and I was explaining the models to you and how we're different to like other models out there. And then um, I'm sure you're going to, you know what I'm going to say. And I looked at you, I'm like, Harz, we just might be onto something here. <laughs> just might be onto some boys, that's it. And that was obviously before we opened up the second location. And then, yeah, fast forward, here we are, mate. Obviously, you're, you've got a location of your own now and you're going to become our first franchisee, which is fantastic. Um, Talking about that now and obviously having a gym of your own, like what made you take the leap of faith? I guess before any big decision, regardless of how good you are, you're going to ask yourself, you know, am I ready? Mm. Um, so yeah, what ultimately made you go, yep, this is the opportunity and I'm going for it. Yeah, I've kind of always felt in a weird way, like I suppose internally about myself, even when I was a young teenager, I always felt like I, you know, I had something for myself and I, I knew something was going to work out for me and I, I didn't know what it was you know whether it was playing footy or whether it was being a fighter or whether it was I didn't I didn't know at the stage but I just knew something was going to work out for me and my mum and dad I always say this to them they always make a joke that I always say like I always brush everything off it'll work out it'll work out everything will be fine and funnily enough it always does uh for myself and for everyone I find as well you know it'll be fine it'll work itself out you know and I try to remind myself that when I am going through really chaotic time periods but I did have a lot of thoughts initially starting where it was the weight what do they say the weight of an unmade decision is always the heaviest you know and that was one of the the biggest things that I was kind of in limbo of of you know I, I knew I, I knew I wanted to do it but I was I you know was really asking myself you know can I handle this you know is this for me because once I sort of go into this this is my life you know what I mean this is this is what I'm going to be doing for you know, not just a year or two, this is, you know, my, my future, you know? And for me, it was, you know, being a, a 20, 21 year old kid, that was like a, a big decision to make. And the reality of it was kind of hitting me in the face of like, far out, this is a big thing that you're diving into halves and you can't like half ass this, mate, you've got to go all into this. And, you know, can you handle that? You know what I mean? Can I handle it if it goes wrong? Can I handle it, it if it goes right? You know what I mean? And I kind of had those kind of thoughts naturally as anyone kind of would. Um, but I just knew, you know, I just sat there and went, well, hey, what else are you gonna do? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what else am I gonna do? Am I gonna go back working at Ollie's? Like, you know, no way. So like, this is what I do, this is what I love. And, you know, I've always thought that I was a bit special in that kind of way, like I had something waiting for me. And I went, mate, you know what? And I had a lot of the people around me that, you know, that love me and support me. And they just gave me the reassurance. They said, you know, halves, if anyone can do it, it's gonna be you, mate. So. And hearing that kind of stuff from the people around you that love you and support you, you know, my, my girlfriend and my, my friends and family be like, mate, if anyone's capable of doing it, it's you. So mate, who else is gonna be able to do it? And I was like, you know what, true that. So <laughs> I just went, you know what, maybe this is for me. This is what I gotta do. This is my, you know, and this is what I love doing. You know, I'm, I'm, it's, I couldn't think of doing anything else, you know, laying bricks or mate, I could not be bothered doing nothing like that. Getting up at five in the morning out in the freezing cold, stacking bricks up, I just would, I could never imagine myself ever doing something like that. And I would look at, you know, people around me doing work, doing work and doing jobs that just, you know, I just would, mate, I could think of anything else I'd rather do, to be honest with you. And I just think, you know what, my job is to come in here, play good music, motivate people, teach people something I love and just be around. Like at times I catch myself, I'm just talking to some of the boys and some of the members or some of the girls and we're just having conversations. And I'm like, mate, this is my job. You know what I mean? Like, this is just like, <laughs> this is awesome. You know what I mean? And I'm so thankful that I did fully invest and fully go for it because, um, yeah, I, I look at a lot of other people my age and, you know, I looked at myself and thought, and I think I said this to you early days as well and thought, what excuse do I have not to go for it? You know what I mean? I have a fully functioning body. I'm young. 
um, you know, got a good family. Like I have literally nothing wrong in my life at all. And I thought, you know what? I felt almost more pressure on myself to become successful because I'm like, I've got no excuse or no out to go like, oh, well, my mum and my dad broke up. Or, well, oh, I was born with this. Or, you know, I had some disadvantage of some sort. And I kind of had no excuse to fall back on. So I kind of felt more pressure to try to become something because I was like, wow, if I really don't make it, then it's just my own incompetency, you know? And I was like, damn, that's going to be pretty harsh reality if that smacks me in the mouth one day. So that kind of gave me the reassurance and the belief in myself just to go, you know what? We live one life, let's go for it. So. That was pretty much it, man. Absolutely, mate. And here you are. And now, obviously, now that you've taken the initial stages and you've only been open for a few months, but you know, you're already starting to build a great community here at Hoppers Crossing. What's your goal, some of your goals for the franchise? Um, yeah, I suppose the biggest goals for myself would be one, um, and we're getting close to it now already, even though it's being early days, but just getting the gym you know, getting that real feel of the gym, that family kind of feel of the gym that we have at Melton where everyone knows each other, everybody's friends with each other, and it feels like you can just walk into work, hey, mate, how you going, you know? And it's just like, you're surrounded by good people always, which, you know, we're, we're pretty much at that stage now, you know, we're, we've got a decent membership base, um, and we're already starting to, you know, make, you know, these room full of strangers become close friends, you know, which is really, really cool. So that was, Definitely the first priority for me is just to get everyone friendly and familiar with one another and start to you know, build some relationships with everybody. Um, one to, or two to, to expand the team and to, to keep growing as the gym keeps growing as well, grow the team with more people and more opportunities for the team as well, um, which again has been a whole new experience for me as well, you know, managing you know, team members and staff and you know, building pathways for them and stuff like that has been a whole nother experience in itself. Um, and three, just really getting my family, you know, really settled in here as well. Now my mum, pretty much this is her, you know, relatively part-time, full-time gig now. She, she quit her other job and she's been working here, which has been awesome. Um, my father, you know, who's also a coach here, as you guys know, he works full-time outside of here and comes down here three, four times a week as well. Um, so he's been coming down here part-time casually as well um, to eventually definitely be able to get the stage where, you know, we can, have the gym big enough where eventually, you know, potentially dad can come and work here full time and maybe leave his other job. Um, so a few personal goals for myself to be able to say, you know, or to be able to have my family be able to rely solely on the gym as well, which would be really, really cool. Um, and just to keep, you know, smashing it out, I guess, just to keep absolutely helping the community as much as we can, have some big shows, have some big events, create some good memories for everybody. Um, just get everybody fit and healthy, loving life and, and having a laugh along the way, really. Absolutely, mate, 100%. And you touched on the community aspect and obviously the support from your family and things like that, which I feel are very important. On that note, how important do you think it is? I guess when I think of the hit fit model, I think of two things. One, the technical aspect of like, oh, cost per lead, conversion rates and yeah. stuff like that, which is obviously very important. But what's equally, if not more important, is doing things right on the front end, that's mm -hmm. building the relationships where some, of course you can get numbers from everything, but that's kind of the less, things that are less likely to be tracked and you just kind of get the feeling when you walk into the place, you know? Mm. Having a good culture, obviously between the members, but also with your staff, you know, going about things the right way. How important do you think that element is? Um, and how does that affect, I guess, some of the business numbers as far as driving revenue and profitability? Yeah, I think it's massive to be honest. And, and I was saying this to one of the guys the other day as well, actually, where, you know, it's such a great, it's such a great business model as well, because one, if we have those standards within the team and ourselves of, of that culture and that kind of motivating drive and going above and beyond and doing the one percenters and, and stuff like that, you know, in the culture of the team and the staff, one, obviously that's gonna help our performance and things like that as well, but, we're leading by example for the members as well. You know what I mean? I mean, at the end of the day, us here as coaches, we're motivators, we're supposed to be role models, um, and we have to be strong, we have to do the extra stuff, and we have to, you know, sometimes do things that we don't necessarily feel like doing. Um, you know, whether that's, you know, for the members coming here and training on a cold, rainy day, and for us waking up at 6 a.m., putting a smile on our face, playing good music and being good energy at 6 a.m. in the morning. You know, I think us leading by example to, one, keep that, the standards high for ourselves and our, and our members as well, where, you know, in this business model, where 
we win and where the members win, everybody wins, you know what I mean? Which is what's so fantastic about it is where, you know, the members are feeling good, they're losing weight, they're feeling healthy, they're feeling fitter. And for the team, we're driving these high standards as well so that we can get the best out of the members, but the members in turn obviously will get the best for us as well, you know? So it is in this gym and in this business, it is such a win-win scenario where if everybody's winning, everybody's winning, and everybody wants everyone to win always because if we were just a gym where everyone came in and no one got results, we wouldn't be in business very long, you know? So our expectations and, and our, um, you know, what we actually want for the members and stuff like that here as well is, is we want to actually genuinely want the best out of them because in turn, we're gonna get the best for ourselves as well, you know, in, in, a, in a selfish kind of way as well, but it's a win-win scenario for everybody. So that's why, I think it's so great for us to always have these kind of standards and, and you know, these responsibilities, you know, to, to one, start with us and the team, to then reflect out to the members, and then we can keep our, keep each other at a certain standard as well. So, um, yeah, it really is a win-win scenario for everybody, for sure. In addition to what you just mentioned, what do you think sets HitFit apart from other boxing and fitness gyms? Yeah, it is that a lot, you know, it's the, it's one, the community, you know, everyone that we hear that comes here for the first time, they say, you know, I've been to other gyms before and you walk in the door, oh yeah, hey, how you going mate? They scan their tag, they walk in, they put their headphones on, they don't know anybody else in the gym, they don't even know what they're doing, you know what I mean? A lot of them just go on the treadmill for 30 minutes, they don't know what to do, they're too scared to, to go anywhere because they feel like they're getting judged because they don't know what they're doing, they feel like an idiot, um, they're not motivated to go, you know, especially when it gets colder and it gets wetter and it gets, you know. So for us, the, the thing that definitely drives us so, so differently from everybody else is one, you know, the biggest thing honestly is the community, you know, and something as small as even the girls the other day, I was having a chat with one of their girls, um, uh, Ashley the other day, and she's come friends with this girl named Tanya. Something as small as Tanya goes, oh, Ash, you coming tomorrow? Gave her a fist bump and said, oh, I'll see you tomorrow. And Ashley all of a sudden was like, all right, well, I'll see you tomorrow, you know what I mean? So something as small as that, I think we forget how powerful something like that is. Um, and all of a sudden Ashley's telling me, she's like, oh, I wasn't gonna come, but now I feel like I have to come because Tanya's expecting me to come, so I'm coming now, you know? And naturally, those kind of relationships in that community in the gym, you guys help, you know, everybody helps keeps each other accountable as well, which is what separates, you know, if you go into a normal gym and you're there on your own, I mean, mate, you know, you walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes, everyone, I'd want to blow my brains out doing that. That is terrible, that's not fun at all. But you can come in here with 30, 40 other people, all got their own individual goals and problems and worries in their own kind of life, but we can all come in here in these four walls, we forget about it for 45 minutes, we all have a good sweat on, whether you wanted to lose weight, whether you wanted to be a, a world champion, whether you wanted to get a bit stronger, build your confidence up a little bit, everyone's kind of got their own different pathways and goals that they want out of their training. But at the end of the day, when we all come in here and we're all doing this session for 40, 45 minutes, and we're giving those fist bumps around, mate, I don't know what you're here for, but respect. You know, we're here trying to be a better person and everyone's got that mutual respect for each other straight away. And we'll do our best to make sure that everyone can get the best out of themselves while they're here as well, you know? So I think that's the biggest thing, honestly, that's gonna separate us from, from any other place around the world. Absolutely, man. And I think we identified that as a team early on to be like, what's actually important about what we mm -hmm. do? You know, why do the members keep coming back? And we really highlight it was the relationships. It was the community. And one tagline I got of you is function over fashion. <laughs> that kind of really like obviously, and I definitely agree with that. I just never expressed it in that way. I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good one. And I think one sometimes as business owners, you get caught up in you know, the the whirlwind of like, oh, you know, what can I do to make the experience better or the service yep. better? And there's so many gyms out there where they do have, you know, really nice locations or nice retail mm. spaces. They do have the fancy <coughs> lights, they have the best toilets, they have, you know, hair dryers in the bathroom and all that stuff is obviously fantastic, but the members aren't gonna keep coming back because the bathrooms yeah. were nice, you know? And we really identified that, which of course, you know, our places are professional, et cetera, <laughs> but we understand that, you know, the reason why members come to us and the thing that we're struggling with, we've always looked at it you know, through the lens of them mm. versus us, because sometimes we're not always our ideal customer, you know, when we really kind of really, again, asked for feedback, created things like, you know, the voice of the hit fit fam to truly understand what's important. Mm. And we effectively, you know, run our business for the members, not mm. vice versa. You know, we yep. run a business because we like it and the members are just there, you know, mm. paying their fees. So I think that's something that's been, you know, really, really important. From yourself, mate, have you had a similar experience 
I guess, running your own gym because, again, from my experience, when I first started, one thing I struggled with is like, man, there is like an infinite amount of things to do here where like I can't do it all. Even mm. if I do do it all, one, I'm going to go crazy and I'll probably do a crap job, you yeah. know? So quickly I realized that you have to prioritize and you have to kind of put things like, okay, understand your thousand jobs. What are the top three to five things that need to get done? What's mm. important? What's going to go drive the business forward? Have you had a similar experience in your obviously short time running your own location? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the principles that even you had laid out on the on the 10 principles as well. I think it was, you know, focusing on the right things is as important as working hard. And it is very true. And you see that time and time again, where I think business owners, you know, and other gym owners, they focus on, they put a lot of emphasis and a lot of time just on the wrong thing, you know, on, you know, making the t-shirts look cooler, or making the reception nicer, or, you know, like you said, all those things that you kind of list off. Of course, those are good things, but at the end of the day, you know, we're here to, to serve the customers and the members and it's mate, what can I do to make your life, your experience here better so that you love it, you get more out of it and you're gonna keep coming back because that's what I want for you at the end of the day, mate, you know? There's no point in you coming here for a month working hard and then leaving out and we never see you again, you put on 10 kilos, you know, there's no point in that, you know? You're not gonna walk in and go, oh, their shirts are really nice, I'm gonna come back tomorrow. That's not what it's about at all, you know? And I think at times where you know, and you've talked to me this as well, and that was probably one of the biggest things that I got out of those principles was focusing on the right things is just as important as working hard, you know? And you can sit there and, you know, scrub the toilets and make the toilets pristine looking as much as possible, or you can get on the phone, or you could send those emails and, you know, doing the boring work is what really, you know, drives the business forward and drives everybody forward in that sense. So I think, um, that's one thing that I've definitely noticed and one thing I've reasoned why we are having good success here early is because you have definitely instilled that into me from the get-go and I'm doing my best to instill that into, into the team where it's like, guys, we've got to focus on what's important, you know, not what's flashy, you know? And again, it goes back to the saying, mate, function over fashion. One hundred percent, mate. That's um, definitely stuck with me. Like, oh yeah, that, that has a nice ring to it. You know? <laughs> Very in line with where I'm at at this stage in life. Looking back on your journey, Hubs, over the last five or so years, what has been one or a couple of the most rewarding moments? Yeah, um, I think for me, the first one that comes to mind definitely, which was probably honestly the coolest, the coolest thing and the um, most exciting thing and even best memory looking back on was when we were at that winery and we were handing out Christmas presents and Das, Luckily, I don't know if it was by chance or- It was pure chance, pure it wasn't rigged. No. He reckons it's pure <laughs> chance. But he somehow got me as his Chris Kringle. And anyway, he got me this nice pair of shoes and then he went on this nice big long speech about, mate, you've been working here for a long time. You know, you put in the hours, many have come, many have gone. Um, and then he handed me over the keys to Hoppers here, um, which was, I was really not expecting that kind of to happen in that, in that moment there. It really caught me off guard, but it was such a, a cool, memorable experience where I was like, oh, grouse, you know what I mean? It just felt like, you know, the, over the last few years of really hard work, it was just like, you know, like just to get those keys and to have that moment was like really, really special for me, definitely. That was probably the best, you know, core memory for me that I'll probably cherish for a long time. And luckily, Mel got it on video as well, which was really cool to see. Um, but for me, definitely, that's the first thing that comes to mind that was yeah, by far the most rewarding feeling. I remember I went home and uh, I was like sitting in my room going like, fuck, got it, you know what I mean? Grouse, fuck yeah, like come all this way. And you know, it was good to see it pay off at the end. So it was, um, it was really cool that. And it was like just the starting of the journey as well, you know, so it was awesome. Absolutely, mate. No, that's uh, fantastic to hear. And looking forward into the future, like what excites you the most, um, you know, about the next few years? Um, I think it's just kind of like the, the whole, the unknown of it all really, of like, you know, what more can we do? And it's really like, as I'm understanding it more and more now, it really is, you know, your mind's your limit at this point. It's like, we can literally do so much with the model, you know, and there's so many different ways that we can kind of go about it. And the biggest thing for me is like, where it's such an early stage of the business. And, you know, I know that for sure, we're gonna make this thing, you know, massive. Um, and for me, it's just kind of like so exciting of like, Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm in a, a candy store and I'm like far out, like, you know, what should I pick? I'm kind of like overwhelmed with kind of options and things like that that we can do. But for me, that's probably the most exciting thing of like, you know, we have so many things that we can do on the horizon that I'm kind of like, you know, where do we start, you know? So um, for me, it's kind of, you know, 
whether we, you know, opening up multiple locations within the family, you know what I mean? Or whether we just go on to help the company grow as a whole, you know, across Victoria, Australia, and eventually worldwide. <laughs> so uh, whatever it might be, man, but I'm really excited for, for all of us this next, you know, decade of our lives to sort of see how it kind of pans out. But I know it's gonna be exciting. I know it's gonna be very, very fun. So I'm just really keen to sort of see like what's in store for all of us really. Absolutely, mate, and I second that. The last question I have for you, mate, is what advice would you give to someone that might be, you know, in a similar situation you were, you know, four or five years ago where they're starting out as a coach or they have a role within HitFit and they have these great big dreams, but obviously there's a lot of steps and a lot of obstacles to overcome before they make that a reality. What advice would you give to them? 100%. I think it's just about doing what you know you should do. You know what I mean? I think at the end of the day, whether that's, and you know, you're one that always relates back to boxing and I like to as well because it does correlate to life very well, whether that's with work, business, personal, family life, relationships, whatever. Um, but it's just doing the stuff that you know you should do. You know, as a fighter, you know you should be getting up, running in the morning. You know what I mean? You know you should stay back after sparring and do some rounds of shadow. You know you should, you know, all those little one percenters that you know you should do. If you're in the gym, you know, and you see the gym's messy, you know you should stay back, give the gym a tidy, you know what I mean? And you know you should put in that little bit more extra effort or go up to that new trialist and put in that little bit more. And you know, that those kind of one percenters that you feel won't get noticed or you feel, you know, will, you know, not be recognized, those are honestly the things that will get you ahead, to be honest, you know what I mean? Staying back that little bit more or coming in that little bit early, doing that little bit extra um, is really what's gonna separate you know, you from the rest. And for me, it was, I started and I, you know, had nothing that I was really a, sta a, a superstar at really. I wasn't a superstar at running the classes. I wasn't a superstar at, you know, any particular part of the business at all really. But I just knew, you know what, I'm young. I've got a lot of time on my hands. Um, I fully believe that I'm capable of achieving anything I want. Um, and I know for a fact that I can back myself to do whatever it is, whether it's on the phone, on the sales, whether it's running the classes, whether it's doing reception, whether it's managing people, whatever it is, I just had full belief in myself that, you know, whatever the task was, I would do it and I would do it very, very well. And I would promise myself that I would make sure that I would do a great job because it's just doing what you know you should be doing, you know? And I think all of us know that deep down of what we should do and what is gonna make us better. Um, but at times we just get a bit complacent or we get a bit, um, you know, entitled or whatever it is of what we think we deserve or, you know, where we think we should be, etc. But it was kind of just that realization of, you know what, I'm gonna humble myself, this is where I'm at. I'm gonna absolutely kill this and just keep knocking on the door for more opportunity, you know? And if you've got a manager or if you've got a boss or you've got someone who you can ask for more opportunity for, um, you know, you'll only get what you ask for, you know? So if you're not asking, if you're not sitting there knocking on the door, ask for more opportunities, if anything, banging on the door for new opportunities, then they're not gonna come, you know? Um, so I would just say, keep it on the front foot always, doing the one percenters that you know you definitely should be doing and you know that you aren't doing, that you know you should be doing and keep sitting there asking for more opportunity and think, how can I provide more value to the business? If I'm providing more value for the business, then I'm gonna be more valuable in turn as well. Whether that is you do have to go off and learn your own set of skills and then to come back and go, hey, I've learned X, Y, Z now. Can that be a benefit of you? Yes, it can. Sweet, here you go. Um, stuff like that is just so important that you know was a big thing for me to learn. Um, and I'm glad I did learn it early on. So it would just be those main things, doing the one percenters, um, you know, knocking on the door of opportunities and just going above and beyond really. Absolutely, man. I would like to add to that as well. And I think one thing that happens when you are ambitious and you, ha you have this great big vision for yourself is like you said, the humbling thing of, oh, waking up and going to your job or just waking up and like looking at a spreadsheet. And it's so like not exciting compared to the contrast of like, you know, what you want to achieve. Exactly. And I think the thing for me where it can feel a little bit unmotivating where you like, let's say you look at a massive big company, you're like, oh gosh, like I'm struggling just running one gym, they have 200 locations, that's how I want to be, and like, crap, like, you yeah. know, and that can be, you know, when you compare yourself, which they say comparison is the theft or the thief of joy, um, 
which yes, it can be that, but comparison is also, you know, very motivating. So it's obviously a bit of a difficult balance between the two. And then one kind of realization I had, because then I'd feel like some days I'd feel proud of how far we come. Then other days I'd feel not worthy because I'm like, well, really, this isn't a really big achievement because old mate has done X, Y, Z, you know, but of course we know everyone's at different periods in their life, etc., different set of circumstances. And then one thing for me that really kind of hit home is there's a quote by Floyd Mayweather and he said, you can only get ahead by conquering one level at a time. So whatever level you're at, the only thing you should be focusing on is conquering that level. And then once I heard that, I'm like, yeah, and really like when you get kind of spiritual about life, I mean, there's always going to be a level to conquer. So whether you're on level four or you're on level 70, does the feeling of conquering that level change? Mm. Probably not. You know, if you make 100 million, then you make 500 million. Is the, is the feeling going to be any different? No. So it's kind of like a really nice way to stay neutral, to feel like, cool, what level am, am I at? What are kind of like, you know, my, inter, my short to intermediate goals? Let's do that. And I know as soon as I do that, I'm going to go to the next level and next level. And then one day I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and that's the game, you yeah. know? So I think, yeah, as it, and et cetera, to what you said, that's something that's really kept me like relatively level headed and it's probably come with age and experience as mm -hmm. well of like, cool, you know, being thankful that I am at a level, being thankful I do have a challenge, knowing that as soon as I finish it, something bigger <laughs> is going to come exactly. ahead. So that's the first thing. And also to put a smile on my dial every step of the way, you know, because we think, oh, just when I solve this problem, just when I achieve this, I'm going to be happy. Maybe for 30 seconds yeah, <laughs> and then exactly. something else comes after it, you know. So I think the more neutral you can be and the gratitude you have for everything throughout yeah. your journey, you know, whether it's a success, even if it's a loss, you know, like still being grateful for that, for all the lesson that it's going to teach you, that really is the secret to longevity. I agree. And I think even, I suppose, again, to compare it back to fighting, which we do very, very often. And at the moment we're going through our rise up camp for all of our new guys at the moment and everyone's been getting very scared, very nervous. And I just say, mate, this is part of the journey. The only reason that after the fight, you are so on top of the world is because a week beforehand, you're sitting there laying in bed, shitting yourself going, oh my God, I'm gonna get knocked out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that feeling from being all the way down there to then afterwards when you're all the way up here, the only reason it feels like you're all the way up there is because once you're all the way down there, you know? So I think for me now, even like, you, like we were saying earlier, looking back on, all of the previous issues or problems or concerns or whatever you had in your personal life or business life, whatever it is, like in those moments, I really try to enjoy those moments or really sit there and go, you know what? I'm gonna really feel these emotions right now because I know one day I'm gonna have everything I ever wanted and I'm only gonna really appreciate that because of this moment right now, you know? And for me, that has been, like you said, to be gr grateful along the way, to have a smile on your doll because at the end of the day, the problems that we go through in life, you know, really I should be thankful for. These are the problems that I always dreamed of. You know, if I wake up one day and my toilet's over flooded because one of the kids put a whole roll of toilet paper in there, far out. <laughs> you know what I mean? But these are the problems that I once wished for, you know what I mean? So I'm going to sit there, scrub the floors with a smile on my face, you know? <laughs> Absolutely, mate. 100%. I think we've documented something very special, Harbs. We'll look, we're looking back in five or 10 years with everything or with nothing. <laughs> Nonetheless, we'll still be looking back with a smile on our face. 100%. So from Melton, mate, to the whole of Australia. Hey, that's it. Good on you, Darcy. <laughs>